My name is Francesca Equiesi. I'm a writer and multidisciplinary artist, and I would like to tell you about my debut novel called Butter Honey Pig Bread. Butter Honey Pig Bread is a story about three women, a woman named Kambir Nachi and her twin daughters. And it's basically about how they are forced apart and come back together. It's a story of choices and consequence, of betrayal, of healing, of love in all its forms. Three main characters are Kambiri Nachi, Taye and Kainde. Taye and Kainde are the twins. And the, the story is told from three, from three of their perspectives. So it's interwoven. Kambiri Nachi is the first character you meet. And she is someone who believes she's an Awanje. And the Awanje is a spirit in Igbo cosmology that exists to live in a cycle of that birth and death over and over and essentially plague a human family uh, with this cycle where an infant or a small child keeps being born again and dying and the belief is that it's the same spirit. And so this is who Kambiri Nachi believes herself to be, um, but she made a decision to stay alive instead of dying in childhood. And so we follow her throughout her life. And then her twin daughters, Tai and Kainde, um, were, as one would imagine for twins, extremely close in childhood, but then they experience a trauma that drives them apart um, for over a decade of their young adult lives. And the older twin is Taye, and she is um, sort of a lonely, hungry, sort of reserved. Um, she's a queer woman, and a lot of her journey, a lot of her story is trying to find peace with herself and reconcile with her sister. Um, but this is sort of illustrated through many different friendships, relationships and interactions that she has. Um, and then the younger twin is named Kainde and she's a more, I think, um, closed off person. And we follow her journey as she develops her, her career as an artist and grapples with forgiveness. One very obvious thing about the book is that there's a lot of food in it. So food shows up in all the characters' stories. I think most prominently in Tae's story, as she's a character who goes to culinary school and just spends a lot of time working in the, working with food and relating to food. Um, yes, those are the three main characters. I'm going to read a few passages from the book. I'm going to start with the prologue, which introduces you to the concept of the Agbanje. And then I'm going to read basically the beginning of Cambiri Nachi's story. And then I'll read from Kainde's section um, more towards the middle slash end of her story. And then an excerpt from Tai's section about the city of Halifax. I hope you enjoy. Prologue. We are kin, here at the in-between place. We are one being eternal, moving in rotation to the flesh realm, only because we must. A share as the tides, a share as the sunrise, bound to the rhythm of its particular dominion, we must. I is only a temporary and necessary aberration. I, me, such a lonely journey. We separate, single out to eyes and knees, only when we traverse between realms, when we take breath and body, only because we must. But we always return to we, you see? We sing reminders to the eyes. We sing them back home in time. We sing them to a doorway. Death is only a doorway. We are a wanje. Kambirinachi. If you ask Kambirinachi, this is how she'll tell it. There was a spirit, a child whose reluctance to be born and subsequent boredom with life caused her to come and go between realms as she pleased. Succumbing to the messy ordeal of being birthed, she would traverse the flesh realm only to carelessly, suddenly let go of living like it was an inconvenient load. Death is only a doorway, and her dying was always a simple event. She would merely stop breathing. 
It was her nature. The dark tales of malevolent spirit children Ogbanjes are twisted and untrue. It was never her intention to cause her mother misery. She was just restless. It was just the way. The time before her final birth, in an attempt to make her stay, her mother marked her with a red hot razor blade, just as the Babalawa instructed. Three deep lines at the nape of her neck, below the hairline, smeared with a pungent brown paste that burned and burned. All this so the Agbanje would stay bound to its body. And if not, at the very least, she would recognize it should the child choose to be born again. The child died, of course. She returned again, and maybe she took pity on the woman, or perhaps she was bored with the foreseeable rhythm of her existence. But this time, she chose to stay and the three horizontal welts on the back of her neck signified to the woman, her mother, that this was the same child. It might have been a coincidence. Perhaps the woman's mother-in-law, she'd never liked her, she found her haughty. Perhaps she'd marked the child in secret to torment her. Nevertheless, for Kambirinachi, living was a tumultuous cascade between the unbearable misery of being in this alive body indefinitely and an utter intoxication with the substance, the very matter of life. When there was peace, life was near blissful, but otherwise, Kambirinachi's childhood was nightmarish for her mother. Ikena was an exhausted woman, a woman made hard by nearly two decades during which her body betrayed her or, as some might put it, almost two decades of being plagued by an Awanje that caused her three late-term miscarriages, one stillbirth, two dead infants, and a dead toddler. She used to be much sweeter, softer, kinder, but it's impossible to go through that particular brand of hell and stay untouched. She couldn't help it. She hated the child a good portion of the time, and the child too must have hated her after making her wait and suffer, only to wail the way she did, unprovoked, inconsolable, and seemingly interminable. To preserve her sanity, and frankly, the child's well-being, Ikenna retreated inside herself, saving all tenderness for her husband, and leaving only a barely concealed indifference for Kambirinachi. Kainde. Anamoya is a word I found a few years ago on a website called the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. It means nostalgia for a time you've never known. I scribbled it in my journal, and in the years since, when I started taking my art practice seriously, I would write it all over my canvases before priming. Because even though I couldn't taste the feeling at the time, I knew that I knew it, that I'd felt it before. I feel it again now at Isabella's engagement party. I taste its full-bodied flavor, pungent and salty. It's unmistakable. I've never been surrounded by old friends and family the way that Isabella is right now, but I feel nostalgic for this moment. I am watching in slow motion as Isabella, wrapped in a sheer coral maxi dress that shimmers as she moves, her afro a glittering halo laughs and playfully slaps Toki on the shoulder. Some familiar faces surround her, secondary school friends with whom I failed to keep in touch. Isabella kept in touch. She tended to the garden of her life and grew a community, a community that shows up to her engagement party and packs her backyard dense with swaying bodies. Perhaps this is what happens when you stay home instead of eagerly launching yourself into the diaspora and disappearing from everything that shaped you, you get a celebration, familiarity, home. Isabella spots us and exclaims, Ibeji, the twins are here. She hurries towards us, hugs us, and ushers us deeper into the celebration. Taya's body stiffens at Isabella's touch. I sense it more than I see it. She is cordial when she offers the spiked zobo 
and smiles politely at Isabella's squeal of delight. Isa, this is my husband, Farouk, I say. Up close, I see that I didn't imagine it. Her hair is dusted with gold shimmer. So lovely to meet you, Isabella says. She waves Toki over. Tokumba Pedro swam with us at the Koei Club when we were children. Unlike most other boys in our cohort, he wore speedos instead of swimming trunks. When he wasn't following Isabella around like a lost pet, he swam many laps to the deep end and back, while the rest of us splashed around the shallow end playing Marco Polo. He was such a small framed, crusty nosed boy. I remember towering tall over him until I left for Canada at 18. So I am stunned at the broad shouldered, polished mahogany heft of a man that walks towards us. Toki is all grown up. Tokes, Isabella says, remember the twins? Of course, his voice is still slightly nasal, a remnant of the sniffly child that vied for Isabella's attention, but more assured. He kisses Tai and me on our cheeks with a distracted, long time, how far? Then he offers Farouk a firm handshake. Long time indeed. I smile and attempt to locate something genuine in the smooth skin of his face, the shallow curve of his distant smile, his commanding demeanor. It's not very difficult to spot a hardened person. Thickening one's proverbial skin can only be a natural response to the causticity that life sometimes visits upon us. But there's a unique type of hardness, a single-minded drive to thrive through whatever the fuck, to tear through whoever, to get what you want, that levels everything so that nothing is sacred. Someone else might call it sharp, masculine, capable of getting anything done. But I knew Toki when we were children, and if you ask me, something happened between then and now that took some light away from him. Perhaps it's just what happens when we grow up. Could he look at me and come to the same conclusion? Taie. Halifax is a small city, beautiful and old. If you visit during the sweltering height of summer, you can prance along the crowded boardwalk and sway your hips to the music of many buskers performing in the salty breeze of the harbor. You can stop along the waterfront for a variety of full fat ice cream. Salty, saucy, cheesy poutine, sugar-coated beaver tails, fish and chips, and an assortment of taffies, cakes, and sweets. Downtown, you can visit the public gardens where you may enjoy the pretty flowers, the fountains, and the comical sight of fat bumbling bees in the bird enclosure. If you wander north to any of the many microbreweries and bistros, it might be difficult to ignore the glaring scars of gentrification, but you must, if you have any intention of savoring your Jonah crab bao bun or your mezcal and tapash cocktail. And if while nursing the aforementioned cocktail, you start to wonder where all the black and indigenous people are, well, we'll have to get back to that. If like Tae, you turn up in September and are lulled into sentiment of warmth and wellness, by all the torrid gorgeousness of red oak trees aflame in autumn. Don't lose hope when the brittle cold descends swiftly and without notice. If you feel discouraged by the severity of that wet winter cold seeping right down to your core, hold tight until spring. It all comes alive again. In the meantime, there will be hot tea, wool socks, warm bread, and soups to tide you over. Yeah. <laughs>